Welcome to stage the founder of HashiCorp, Armin Dajer, or co-founder, I'm sorry, right? Do that, buddy. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jim, for the introduction. Thanks so much for the uh, whole Cockroach team for, for hosting us and putting this on. Uh, it's fun to be uh, talking about multi-cloud. So the, the sort of title of my talk was a little too large to actually fit on the slide. Uh, but what I really wanted to spend some time is talking about sort of what are the various definitions? How do we actually navigate what we mean when we say multi-cloud? I think we kind of use the term all the time, right? We say our customer is doing multi-cloud or we're designing our app to be multi-cloud. But it's not really like a monolithic thing. It's not a binary, right? There's sort of many varied definitions of what that could actually mean. So I want to sort of dig into the nuance there. Uh, for those who don't know me, Jim sort of beat me to the introduction. My name's Armand Dodgar. I'm one of the co-founders and CTO of HashiCorp. You'll find me all around the internet as just Armand. So if you have any questions, want any follow-up, uh, please feel free to find me and reach out. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of HashiCorp, sort of wondering why you're at a multi-cloud conference, but um, you know, we make sort of a category of a few different types of tools really focused on uh, infrastructure management, especially around sort of cloud infrastructure automation. Uh, probably most prevalent are Terraform for doing provisioning, Vault for managing secrets, credentials, uh, encryption, data management, Console for doing sort of service discovery, service mesh architectures, and Nomad as our application scheduler and deployment engine. And so when we talk about kind of like what's our view, what's our thesis at HashiCorp, I think, you know, it's not going to be a surprise for anyone in this room. It's that the world is going multi-cloud, right? And so we're starting when you look primarily within, let's call it the global 10,000. These are folks who, you know, 99, 100% of their infrastructure lives on-premise on dedicated infrastructure, right? Relatively homogenous, probably mostly VMware, right? And they're starting from that and saying, great, I'm going to adopt maybe a cloud provider of choice. And whether it's, you know, Amazon, Google, Azure, et cetera, they're going to say, great, maybe I'll start there and I'll have multi-cloud from the very get-go, right? By definition, my infrastructure is already on-premise. So the moment I say, like, let's start going out to AWS, now I have two, I'm a multi-cloud sort of scenario. Our view is that actually for all of these custom companies, right, everyone in the global 10,000, they're inevitably going to end up in sort of all of the above, right? And, the, and we sort of joke it's, it's multi-cloud by accident or multi-cloud by intent, right? You either say, I intentionally see differentiated value, I'm going to use, you know, the AI, ML, data services in Google, I'm going to use managed Microsoft middleware in Azure, I'm going to use, you know, developer services like, you know, uh, that people love, like Cognito and AWS, and great, I'm going to design for that, I'll be multi-cloud. Or you say, I'm going to go all in on one cloud provider, and then through M&A you buy a company that is in a different cloud, and now you're multi-cloud by accident, right? So that's what we mean. It's like at a certain large enough scale, there's enough M&A activity taking place that it's impossible that every company you buy has made the exact same infrastructure choices that you have, right? So how do we sort of cope with the fact that if we're a large enough organization, multi-cloud will be our reality, right? So, oh, so when we talk about multi-cloud, I think we tend to talk about it sort of in this monolithic way, but I think it's worth sort of you know, scratching a little bit deeper and saying, okay, there's actually a few different flavors of it, right? And they're not exactly equivalent. They don't preclude one another. You can be sort of some of these and not others of these, and all of these are multi-cloud uh, in their own way. So I think it's worth sort of digging in and talking about the nuances of each of these. So the first one is data portability, right? When we talk about data portability, I think there are sort of two ways to talk about it. One is to talk about it in the sort of language of optionality, right? I want the option to move my data, right? I might not exercise this option, but I want to have that as sort of an escape hatch or, a, you know, a business decision I can make down the road. The other is sort of continuously, right? So I want my data continuously available in multiple regions, right? And these two are sort of fairly different decisions, right? If you decide you want one or the other, you have to make pretty significant architectural choices uh, to support it. I think one of the things that pops is when you try and understand What's the business cost of doing, of each of these choices, right? They're very different, right? The cost of doing things continuously is relatively constant, right? As I'm updating data, as I'm ingesting things, I'm sort of actively paying the price to replicate it between multiple sites. So I'm going to pay the bandwidth to, let's say, push to two, three, ten clouds, whatever I might want to do, right? But I'm paying that over time. As each incremental record comes in, I'm paying it then. The optionality is very different, right? I'm going to accumulate this giant data lake, right? I'm going to keep, you know, adding data in one cloud, and at the moment that I decide I want to exercise it, now I have a huge bill, 
right? Because I've accumulated not, you know, 10 records to move every hour, I've accumulated a billion records that need to be moved all at once, right? So there's a sort of snowballing of cost. And so it's useful to kind of think about, you know, how do these two impact the way I, I sort of architect, right? A different lens of this is kind of thinking about the cost at different periods, right? What's the initial cost? Well, in both of these modes, it's pretty low, right? Because at that point, I don't really have data, right? So it's really around the architecture of the application. Do I architect for optionality? Do I architect for sort of doing things continuously? What's my ongoing cost, right? Whether that's storage, whether that's bandwidth, right? I think with optionality, it's, you know, low, right? I'm saying I'm just going to write to one cloud, right? So I'm not paying that, you know, the bandwidth cost, the storage duplication, et cetera. But with continuous replication, I am, right? I'm sort of paying it down slightly as I go. Right, I'm paying in small increments. Now, when I look at what's my deferred cost, when you talk about the optionality, it's huge, right? It's potentially very high, depending on how much data you have to process, versus what I've done with continuously replicating my data is I've sort of paid for it in advance. So the two analogies I like to use is, one is a stock option, right? I'm paying a small price up front to sort of have the option to exercise, but it's expensive should I choose to exercise it. And the other one is sort of insurance, right? I'm kind of paying my bill every month. You know, maybe I need to use it, maybe I don't. Right, but when I do need to use it, my house burns down, right, it doesn't cost me that much. I've already paid for the insurance, right? So those are the two analogies I like to use when you think about this. So what do I mean when there's sort of an upfront uh, design? I think with either of these, there's an investment you have to make in design. You have to sort of think about what is the goal I want to achieve and how do I, what are the choices I need to make to support that? I think what becomes clear is proprietary cloud services tend to be a one-way street, right? So if I'm building on top of Dynamo, Cosmos, Spanner, they might be cool, but they don't really give me either of these, right? They don't give me optionality. They don't give me continuous replication. I'm sort of trapped to that cloud vendor, right? Because that, that technology is proprietary and non-portable. So if I say, okay, great, what I really want to do is enable optionality, there's sort of a lower bar here, right? What you really need to do is say that I have a common interface that's available to me uh, in each of these regions, in each of these clouds, et cetera. And so you can do this with a wide variety of systems, right? MySQL, Postgres, you know, et cetera. What really matters is do I have sort of an implementation that's portable, right? So that, you know, if I mo decide to move from, you know, cloud A to cloud B, the implementation doesn't break my application. We are speaking the same API. And that the application, the data storage system, has some notion of the ability to import or export, right? So in a SQL example, you can always do a SQL dump on one side get your ginormous output, sort of ship it over the wire, do the import on the other side, and great, you've sort of exercised the optionality, right? Most of these systems make it very difficult to do this in real time, right? Like, you're not going to move a multi-hundred gigabyte or terabyte database in real time, right? Like, this is going to be, you know, you're shutting your website down for, you know, hours, days to do this sort of data migration, right? So this tends to be a pretty expensive trigger when you pull it. The other side is doing it with more sort of a continual replication, right? And I think, you know, hopefully for most of the people here, technologies like Cockroach are familiar. But I think there's a sort of set of modern kind of what I'll call cloud native data systems that think about this in a different way, right? Systems like Postgres, MySQL were designed around sort of more traditional on-premise physical data center model, right? Versus sort of new systems like Cockroach are really designed for this modern cloud world and really thinking around how do you provide that continuous availability, right? And so what you're getting by running the system, a common system across all these systems, is by definition, it's a common interface, it's a common implementation, right? Your app's not gonna break as it's moving from one site to the other, but you're also getting that real-time replication. You're paying that cost now on a continuous basis so that when you do that move, it's not painful, right? You're not pay you don't get a huge bill after the fact, right? So I think if we kind of summarize data to sort of think about what am I architecting for, right? Is it optionality? Is it continuously available? That will then impact, you know, what set of upfront design decisions you're gonna make. And it does require some discipline, right? Like you have to think about it and not just go, you know, hog wild on the cloud native services, right? And I think your cost profiles will vary dramatically based on workload, right? This is a bit of a generalization that assumes you have sort of an ever-growing data set. Maybe you have a, you know, an update frequent, right? You're updating a small data set uh, or you have a static corpus or things like that. So, you know, you have to kind of apply this to your own domain and understand what does this look like uh, as you sort of draw the line out. So a totally different type of portability when we talk about multi-cloud is the idea of workflow portability, right? 
And so if I had to kind of capture what I, you know, the intent here is to say something like, I want the ability to provision and deploy to multiple environments, right? And that's really about workflow portability. So I have users, they're developing their application, and then maybe I have multiple runtime environments, right? I have cloud A, cloud B, my on-premise environment. And so as a developer, they want to be able to have the choice and say, great, for this one I'm consuming, you know, this Google service, so that should go out to Google. For this one, I need to talk back to my on-premise mainframe, so that thing needs to live on-premise, et cetera but I wanna have a common workflow in terms of how I deliver my applications. I don't want to have different tools, different workflows for each environment. And so when you talk about application delivery workflow, it's not one monolithic workflow, right? There's sort of many sub-workflows in there to talk about, right? It's how do I build and distribute an artifact? How do I provision and manage infrastructure? How do I do the actual deployment? How do I secure credentials? How do I monitor uh, all these applications? How do I get alerted if something is wrong, right? So there's many different workflows under this umbrella that we need to kind of consider. And I think if you look at many of the cloud providers, they provide tools to do a lot of these things, right? So if I look and start provisioning, you might have, you know, VMware-centric tooling on-premise, you might have cloud formation, you might have uh, Google Resource Manager, Azure's ARM templates, et cetera, et cetera. And in kind of each of these categories, the vendors will have their own set of tools, right? I can use Code Deploy on Amazon or Azure DevOps on Azure, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's a whole ton of tools that the clouds provide but it's a super fragmented landscape, right? It makes it very hard to have a common workflow if I'm using these tools that are specific to each of the clouds, right? So when we think about, for example, the kind of the HashiCorp model of it, it's, you know, and we were not gonna get into the tools here, but it's how do I have a common workflow and sort of abstract the details of the clouds or allow the kind of best of breed to be used, but use it in a common workflow. So if you take a tool like Terraform, it's a common way the developer writes infrastructure as code to define, here's the set of resources I want, here's how I want it configured, and then there's a set of plugins that allow it to work with, you know, your cloud vendor of choice, your on-premise technologies of choice. And so what you end up with is great, I can pick and choose the technologies I want, but from a development perspective, from a day one, day two management perspective, it's a common workflow around the whole thing, right? And the same thing with the rest of the tools, really looking at how do I provide a common workflow, whether it's a security problem, networking problem, application deployment, right? But this only covers, you know, the, our tools are only a small, small piece of this whole ecosystem, right? There's a huge, rich ecosystem of tools that touch on all of these different workflows, right? So if you look at a tool like GitHub, you can actually think about that as enabling multi-cloud in a way that's distinct from if I used, you know, Amazon's Code Deploy or Azure's DevOps, right? Those are a little bit more tied to this particular environment. Same with using like Circle CI versus an integrated CI. If I'm using Artifactory for package management as opposed to, you know, the Google Container Registry, right? So with each of these categories, you can sort of talk about, yeah, you can see how this tool enables me to architect in a way that I'm supporting a multi-cloud workflow rather than sort of using sort of tools that might be pinned to a specific environment, right? This is a small list of the options. I'd need like 20 slides to go through the whole ecosystem. Uh, and so, you know, just this is not me saying these are the only things. So I think when we talk about the workflow portability, there's a few pieces of this that are important, right? One is really thinking about, okay, what are those steps that I go through as either a developer, as an operator, as a DBA? How am I architecting those to be sort of common across these different environments, right? And wherever possible, I wanna use agnostic tools that can work across all of those, right? Because if I don't, then I end up having to add a fragmentation step to my worker and say, oh, depending on where I'm deploying, I have to use one of these four different registries right, or depending on, you know, how I'm doing X, you know, here's a, here's a branch within my process. And every one of those then that you add can turn into sort of a whole tree, right, where as a developer you're like, okay, there's a thousand different sort of possible options in this sort of delivery tree I have to walk through. Uh, it becomes a bit of a nightmare, right? It, this is not me saying you can't use the cloud services, right, and I think that is an important distinction is understanding what's a sort of post-deploy application dependency versus a you know, pre-deploy or application sort of workflow uh, to get something into production. So you almost certainly can use the application middleware and use those to your best advantage. I mean, that's the reason I think a lot of people go to cloud is you have this great collection of services available. They improve your time to market. You don't have to rebuild basic things like I'm gonna go build my own graph database or, you know, et cetera, right? Or, you know, run my own memcache cluster, right? So great, go leverage all that stuff but acknowledge that when you do, it sort of pins the app to that environment, right? If I decide, hey, I'm gonna use, you know, whatever this particular cloud, you know, something like Redis doesn't sort of lock you in, but, you know, a more sticky high value service does, it tends to be non-portable, but that's okay, right? You might say some applications are deployed to specific environments, 
but I have a common workflow. App A always goes to Cloud A, App B always goes to Cloud B, and they have a set of cloud-specific dependencies, right? And so I think what this sort of lands at is workflow portability does not necessarily imply or require data portability, right? These two can be very distinct. I can deploy App A and it reads and writes everything from S3. Well, now that app isn't portable, right? But I have a common workfl uh, workflow that lets me deploy B, C, and D without having to relearn my tool chain, right? So it's sort of driving a distinction between that. The next one is workload portability. Right? And I think this tends to be what most people sort of talk about or maybe sort of mean whether or not they, they're sort of are explicit about it when they talk about multi-cloud. And I think this sort of gets summarized as I want to be able to move my workloads between environments. Right? I want to be able to push a button and move it from cloud A to cloud B. Right? And so what that might look like is I'm operating my application. It has a set of upstream dependencies and databases, et cetera, that it's, I'm using. And then I want to push a button and say, great, migrate that to Cloud B. Maybe for cost purposes or, you know, et cetera, leverage, negotiating leverage with clouds, uh, you know, pick your favorite reason. And so I think what you end up realizing, and we'll kind of dig into this, is this ends up being a source of both data and workflow portability, right? It means you inherit a whole bunch of requirements to make something like this actually work, right? The first part of it is when you say, okay, maybe I want to move this particular app. What you're really also implying is, well, all of its upstream dependencies and all of its data needs to come with it as well, right? It's not that helpful if I move my web server, but my database didn't come with me, right? It's great, now I can't actually access any of the data. So, or if I have a series of upstream APIs that I'm using that are part of processing a request, they sort of need to be there. Otherwise, if I'm crossing the wire uh, to go back to cl you know, cloud A to communicate with those things, sort of defeated the point, right? And so I think what this means is if you really want this, you have to be sort of clear that I can't have that many proprietary services in the chain, or I have to extract them, right? The more proprietary services I'm dependent on, the harder it is to actually pull off a migration like this. And the second is that this, this is sort of a, an infectious requirement, right? If I want to up, you know, do one of my applications, this requirement gets sort of inherited by all of my upstreams, right? It's not helpful if my app can move, but my upstream dependencies can't move, right? That doesn't, doesn't help me. Right? So it becomes a bit of an infectious requirement that touches all of the internal services uh, with time. I think then you have to acknowledge, okay, but a vast majority of my applications need their data, so how does this work? And so this goes back to that sort of data uh, portability and sort of brings you back to saying, well, you kind of have to choose. Do you want to have optional uh, data portability or do you want to have continuous, right? And what that gets back to is, well, how often do you expect to do this migration, right? Is this something you think is totally exceptional, right? It's like if I fail to negotiate you know, my agreement with my cloud provider, then I want to be able to pull the trigger and do this, and so this is an exceptional event. I don't expect to do this regularly, in which case you might be okay with a really large deferred cost. Or do you say, hey, this is something I want to be able to do continuously, right? I want to be able to leverage you know, spot instance pricing and say, great, compute is currently cheaper over here, so I'm gonna do some failover and push more of my compute to cloud A, now when it's cheaper on cloud B, I'll migrate some of that compute back over to cloud B, right? So if you want that, you actually have to architect for your data to be there continuously, right? You're not gonna pay that penalty uh, on an exceptional basis. It would be too expensive, right? So I think you have to start asking these questions of like, what's the goal? How do I intend to leverage this capability, right? Or if I intend to leverage it. And so there's a few sort of special cases to this, which is like one is sort of this notion of like, well, what if I don't move the data? What if I just move the application? let the data be in its sort of the, the original cloud that it's in, right? And so this is sort of the notion of what if I move my front-end services or what if I only move my sort of uh, stateless services? And I think the challenge of doing this is there's sort of a massive penalty for network traffic, as Spencer sort of highlighted, right? And that penalty exists sort of in two ways, right? One is network latency, right? You have to go back and forth between these. Speed of light is fixed. And the other is actually bandwidth, right? The, the sort of pricing constructs of the cloud mean it's you know, sort of like Hotel California, right? Uh, you know, bandwidth in is, is free, bandwidth out, uh, you sort of pay through the nose. So, you know, you have to sort of think about this uh, in that context of saying, okay, if I'm really gonna do this, does it make sense? You know, is my cost saving of, let's say, two cents an hour on the compute going to get offset by now the bandwidth cost of going cross region, cross data center, right, on every single request? And two, is the latency penalty acceptable, right? If I have a complex app that's talking to caches that it expects low latency and databases that it expects low latency, right? That might really uh, harm the user experience if I'm doing this, right? 
So in limited cases, you can see it done. It tends to require a pretty specialized architecture, right? The application has to be aware that you're doing this. If you do it in a naive way, uh, it tends to be really bad, right? Your performance is horrible. But if you architect with this in mind and you understand that you're gonna be doing this, you can build sophisticated multi-layer caches. Maybe you move sort of partial subsets of the data that are relevant to your application, maybe just hot data sets, things like that. And so you can make this work, but I think what you have to acknowledge is this is not a thing that the operations team can do on their own without working with the application team, right? I think there's some things that you can do where it's like it's invisible to developers and invisible to the app team. This is something that needs deep coordination, right? Because if the app is not architected with this in mind, uh, the performance and cost will be sort of terrible, right? So then there's sort of a third special case, right? Which is what if I'm moving the app and I have no data, right? It's just the application, right? This is, you know, more rare than you would expect, right? What you really require for this is basically a stateless application or one that has a static corpus, right? If I'm only looking at a static data set, uh, then this is a lot easier, right? Um, because I can basically pay the penalty one time to just move my static data set and have it on both sites and, you know, it's not changing in an ongoing way, right? So there is a fair number of applications where this makes sense. Uh, things like financial modeling, where you're just doing large-scale compute, and the, you know, the data set is basically you know, what has the you know, equities market done historically for the last 30 years, right? So you might have that data set available in, in multiple locations. Large-scale simulations that are very compute-intensive, right? Particularly if you're scientific, high-performance computing type space, protein folding, et cetera. It's not so data-dependent. It's mostly just very heavy on compute. Right? Testing infrastructure is a great example of this, right? You can kind of think about your test and stage dev environments as stateless, right? Because you're like, yes, they might have databases, but you don't really care what's in them, right? If you're just like, great, I can run my testing infrastructure more cheaply over here, you know, blow away, create a new one, et cetera. Like, hopefully the testing environment is designed to be ephemeral by nature, right? So, you know, there's a fair number of use cases that actually fall into this pattern but again, what this starts to require is more workflow portability, less data, right? Because I'm saying, you know what, I actually don't have data, it's stateless, it's a compute thing, or it's my testing infrastructure, maybe I don't necessarily care, right? I'm gonna blow away the data and just create a blank set of databases on the other side. What this enables is cost arbitrage, right? So you can start to leverage things like spot markets and things like that, and get into the sort of cost arbitrage of, of the different clouds, right? And I think this is when people talk about workload and migration, what they're usually to be able to leverage this, get those sort of cost savings. But I think acknowledging that, yeah, there's edges and, you know, caveats around this, right? And so I think what are the takeaways, right? One is if you want this, you have to design upfront for both the data and workflow portability, right? Two is you have to have relatively limited access to cloud services, right? Or only restrict yourselves to, to the ones that are portable or there's something sort of, you know, loosely equivalent in a way that won't break your application. And so this tends to be fairly impractical for uh, a lot of use cases and organizations, right? There's so many kind of ifs, ands, or buts around it that you're like, okay, great, if you fit into this particular bucket, uh, it could work. But I think as a general case, this is very, very hard to achieve, right? And I think the number one reason we see people sort of articulate, you know, wanting to do this is sort of a hedge against lock-in, right? Whether it's, you know, pricing leverage with the cloud or things like that. And so I think the way that you can sort of tackle this is sort of maybe the most practical is having an optionality on data portability and workflow portability. And those two combined gives you sort of that expensive lever, right? If you choose to pull it, right, it's an expensive lever, but you can pull it uh, nonetheless. And sort of the kind of the next form of this, maybe the most sophisticated, is traffic portability, right? And I think the idea of traffic portability is that I want to be able to traffic between my different environments in a dynamic way, right, in an online way, right? So unlike the previous example where we existed in one or the other cloud and we're sort of pushing a button to move it, traffic shifting allows us to sort of operate in multiple sites at, at a time. So we might say in our happy path we're doing 50-50, you know, traffic between these things. Maybe I want to do maintenance and go to 100%, 0%. Maybe I'm doing a canary deploy and it should be 5%, 95%. But I want that ability to dynamically manage how traffic is flowing between these distinct environments, right? And so I think there's, again, within this, a few different flavors of what we tend to see when we talk about traffic portability, right? One is this notion of front-end only traffic, right? So you might still have the sort of super data center or the kind of mothership, 
right, that has most of the data, the most of the coordination, it might be doing kind of a lot of the heavy lift, and then you have sort of a, a hub and spoke architecture, right, so you have the kind of mothership data center, and you might have a ton of little spokes all around the world, right? And what these little spokes are doing is really only doing ingress traffic, right? So you're kind of a point of presence that's trying to be close to the user. Traffic can be ingressed there. But ultimately, that request might touch multiple environments, right? It might need to get forwarded to sort of a central region or the central hub to actually get processed or for data to be retrieved. And so what this ends up being useful for this pattern is things like being able to put caching at the edge, reducing end user latency, uh, and so it's sort of a different kind of, uh, you're baking it into the application architecture, right, that you have this notion of kind of a hierarchical de design, right? What this tends to require is workflow portability. You exist in multiple sites. It requires application architecture, right? The app has to be aware of this and sort of factor in how its data access works, how its caching works. The next one is sort of a, a sort of a enhancement of how much data we're moving, how many services we're moving. It's what I'll call sort of the partial failover case maybe not the perfect term for it, it's sort of a partial replication of backend systems and data. So maybe you say, it's not a carbon copy of my other data center, but most of my backend services are there, most of my data is there. Maybe there's specific things like, okay, I have a core mainframe, you know, that thing is not gonna, you know, move or replicate, so fine, that data's there, but, you know, my other higher level services are right? And maybe I'm doing things like data sharding by region. So I might say I have a central region that knows, you know, user accounts that exist in the whole world, Right, and that's managed out of, you know, whatever, AWS East, but then I have sharded data, right, in, in each of my data centers, maybe for EU data locality or, you know, Asia Pac data locality, et cetera, right? And so what's nice in these sort of architectures is you're improving your high availability, right? You're now, unlike the ingress only, where really if you lose the hub, all of your spokes sort of die as well. In this sort of an architecture, you're increasingly able to tolerate the failure of other regions, sort of the master data center, you should be able to operate in some limited capacity sort of offline. So it starts improving the HA story. It also improves the DR story because most of your data is sort of replicated and available kind of globally. And this starts to require things, more uh, workflow portability, it requires more data portability, so you have to start architecting for, great, should I use something like Cockroach so that my systems are, you know, available and replicated? Wonderful, right? So now I can actually do this sort of traffic shifting and the data is already there. And then there's sort of, you know, the full nine yards, right? I want to be able to, you know, do a full failover and set, you know, my traffic to zero and nuke one of the sites and everything still works, right? This is sort of the most complex scenario. And so in this pattern, ingress traffic can reach any front end. You're generally trying to make sure that that request doesn't leave, right? So I should be able to fully process that request without going back to sort of the mothership, right? I want everything to be there. So this kind of requires that all of your systems, all of your data be replicated and so this is sort of the maximum high availability, maximum data recovery type scenario, right? I'm literally saying I want to push about a nuke a region and be fine, right? And so this requires a ton of upfront investment, right? This is data, workflow, workload, portability all at once, right? So you kind of have to have the full gamut for this to actually work, right? And so I think when we talk about sort of the uh, traffic portability, I think what's simpler and relatively achievable for a lot of organizations is the ingress only, right? Because it doesn't require a whole lot of rejiggering sort of existing systems, right? Partial and full end up, you know, when you look at, you know, what organizations really have that, and they tend to be more of what I'll call sort of the web scale, very mature companies, right? And the reason for it is there's a, there's sort of a cost and complexity inherent in an architecture like that. Right? And so, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think those things end up being motivated by scale, right? Either you want those things because, you know, you don't want to have lock-in or you want sort of pricing negotiation leverage. You have business requirements. So, you know, we work with a lot of customers who, either because of contracts with Walmart or the federal government or et cetera, you know, they're forced into certain things, right? Their data must be processed on certain clouds or data must be in GovCloud only, et cetera. So you start to have to have an application that says, great, maybe my commercial customers are in public cloud, my sensitive federal customers are in a separate gov cloud. There's sort of differences between these regions, et cetera, right? Uh, you start to worry about things like, you know, being able to do migrations if you want, high availability if you're a large global thing, right? You don't, you don't want to be able to have one region take down your kind of global install. Uh, disaster recovery, business continuity, things like that, right? So I think there's a long list of motivations that are practical and real. Uh, that end up just existing, uh, that, that sort of drive you towards building this, but you really only get into that at a pretty large, substantial scale. 
And then there's sort of one that I left out, right, which is sort of the, what if I have no portability, right? I have nothing, right? Uh, and this is sort of the simplest, right, which is just like, I want to use multiple environments, uh, but I don't really have any caveats around it. I have no other constraints. You know, and what are the signs of this, right? Like, what does this look like? Uh, it tends to be using a lot of the sticky and proprietary services. It's a lack of common workflows, right? You see, you know, different workflows for deploying into uh, different sort of sites. Applications that are pinned to an environment and can't be moved, right? Traffic that must be forwarded on a per application basis. So, great, ser this service must always go to, you know, Amazon. This service must always go on-prem. Uh, and generally, just a general lack of building a process around day one architecture, right? If you have a lot of sort of optimization for day one agility, where it's just, you know, run free, use whatever services you want, and we'll sort of figure it out later, very quickly ends up looking like this, right? I think the challenges of this really only show up in day two, right? Day one, you're super agile, you go and you build a lot of stuff and it's fun. Day two operations starts to be where your challenges start to crop up, right? Because now you have a ton of fragmentation and so now when you need to bring in portability, right, whether it's for a contractual reason, whether you're building for HA, et cetera, right, now it's much more complex and expensive, right, because you didn't design for it up front, so you could have had a low upfront design cost, but now you have a very high cost of either data migration, application re-architecture, sort of et cetera, right? You also end up seeing workflow fragmentation cause a lot of day two management headache, right? As you start to get you know, large and regulated and then people say, great, can you add this like, static code analysis to your pipeline? And you're like, actually we have 200 different pipelines and nobody even knows how they're managed, right? Like that's a day two mess, right? It gets much harder to build things like HA and disaster recovery on an architecture like this, right? Because it was never designed for it. So now you're trying to bolt it on later and you end up with a very minimal hedge uh, or minimal negotiating leverage, right? Because you sort of, you know, you built down a one-way road, right? And so in some sense, this is kind of the worst of all, right? Uh, it's not valid, but you know, in some sense you don't get any of the benefits of the other ones. So I think even relatively minimal investments can kind of get you out of this. So maybe just wrapping up briefly, right? I think when we talk about multi-cloud, it's useful to apply some amount of nuance to it, right? It's not just monolithically, are we multi-cloud or are we not multi-cloud? There's many ways in which you can achieve multi-cloud. You can do it through all of these, you can do it through a subset of these things, right? But it kind of depends on what are your goals, what are the outcomes you want to achieve, what optionality do you want to have in the future, right? And really it's about designing with intent, right? And I think if you're a very large organization, adopting the mind frame that, you know, multi-cloud is probably inevitable for us, right? Unless we say we're not gonna buy a company who's not in the right cloud. Very unlikely that, you know, the business people are really gonna care about that detail, right? And so if that's a reality for you, okay, how do you architect for it? And then say, well, what are my realistic requirements, right? Because I think sometimes you see people sort of architect, you know, the requirements as if they're Google when they're not, right? So I think it's useful to be pragmatic about, okay, what really is my scale? What really is my set of requirements? What's a pragmatic thing to actually architect for? And then acknowledging the no portability strategy is sort of the worst of all approaches, but it's what will happen by default if you don't have intent, right? If you don't say, here's a set of guide rails, here's a set of process around what we're trying to achieve. If you just say, you know, go out and build and then let's figure it out, you're very likely to end up in that category, right? Uh, and so that's all I had. Thank you all so much. Hopefully you uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>